Seattle Police Department. I'm on the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. It's a federal task force. It, um, we actually have statewide jurisdiction, so we respond to everything from your cyberbullying cases to your child pornography, child molestation, all of that kinds of stuff. Um, what I typically do is, I'm the victim advocate, so I go around and actually work with the kids that are victimized online. I'm a forensic child interviewer, so I interview little kids for the disclosure of sexual abuse. I look like I'm 14, so I get bought and sold online as a 14-year-old, undercover. And then I go around and do this with the public speaking and the education and all of that sort of stuff. So I'm going to go kind of quick in the essence of time, but um, we're going to start by talking about cyberbullying. We're going to go into talking about social networking sites, we'll talk about the reality of teens as targets, and then do some internet safety tips as well. So um, first thing we'll start off by talking about is cyberbullying. I have little videos in planted in this. Are you guys interested in seeing them? They're each about 30 seconds, or would you prefer me to skip them? Show them? Okay. All right, they're, they're actually the videos I show the middle school age group anyway, so I guess that this is helpful. Hi, guys. Hey. I'm Megan. Hey, Jessica. Megan, you're a tramp. Brian Fitch told me you guys made out. Everybody knows. He said your breast smells like garbage, and he almost puked. He says you're your most desperate girl he knows. Besides your mom. How many boyfriends does she have anyway? Lots. Your makeup makes you look like a clown. That zit is huge. Zit face. So, I show the kids that video for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is that I think kids tend to say things... Well, obviously they say things to each other online that they would never dream of saying to each other's face, but what does that really go back to? And it really goes back to the disconnect that technology has created with that generation and with a lot of adults. Kids and adults tend to forget that when you put something on the internet, it's really no different than saying something to somebody's face. And again, it's because behind the screen creates this illusion that it's very different and you're not saying it to a real person. You're just saying it to a screen or a screen name or a Facebook page. So for our unit, there's about eight of us on it and it really comes back to this lack of empathy that the internet has created for this generation and the idea that if I'm not saying it directly to somebody's face and there's not that immediate consequence, then it doesn't really exist. When you say something to somebody's face, you always get a reaction from them if you said something terrible. Tears, <coughs> anger, maybe you get punched, something like that, versus saying something to a screen and on Facebook, you're not going to get the same reaction. So, again, it obviously leads to this concept that kids think that they're anonymous online. They think if I create this fake name and this fake screen name or this fake Facebook page, nobody will know it's me. The concept of trying to get kids to understand that, one, that's not true because our task force would be out of a job if it was, and two, the idea that once you put something out there, I don't care if you delete it two minutes later, it is forever out there. And kids don't understand that. And a lot of adults don't understand that. I press the delete button, okay, it's off in real time, but is it really gone? Absolutely not. So really trying to hit home those points with our words and actions and our kids' words and actions online. So this actually stems from a segment Good Morning America did on cyberbullying and how moms were participating in kind of this adult bullying. And this comes from a mother who twittered the drowning death of her three-year-old. When he drowned in the backyard pool, she called 911 and actually twittered the fact that 911 was responding, that they couldn't revive him, and ultimately she twittered that he had died. So this actually comes from the idea that this mom actually got her life was physically threatened by adults who disagreed with what she had done. So actually, adults threatening to kill her over the fact that she had Twittered this. So it really starts with adults and our choice of words and our choice of online behavior because kids really see that. 
So in terms of prevention and detection, one of the biggest things that parents need to understand is you need to be aware of what types of information your child is choosing to post about themselves. The internet's not a diary, and it shouldn't be used as one. If your child is at an age, especially middle school, high school, a lot of kids post things that they're going through, their thoughts and feelings, maybe they're dating somebody and then they break up, or things of that nature. And the internet's not a diary, and if your child wants to blog about something like that, open up a Word document, you save it, you go back to the old school way of writing in a journal and hiding it under the pillow, and then only the sibling finds it, not this whole school sort of embarrassment mentality that comes with kids and teenagers putting that personal information on the web or on Facebook and things of that nature. The quality of online communication is really important because parents need to track online behavior and your kids' attitudes and what changes. If your child's consistently upset or very angry after getting off the internet or off using Xbox, what's going on while they're on it to create that sort of change in behavior and change of mood? Nowadays, it usually always goes back to Facebook, unfortunately. So really paying attention and asking the right questions. Emotional distress, disrupted friendships. This is really key for girls because Girls tend to, all teenagers are trying to find that group that they fit in with and that group of friends, but for girls especially, if they're friends with this one girl for years and years, or sixth grade through eighth grade, and then all of a sudden something happens and she doesn't want to hang out with Susie anymore, or whatever the girl's name is, what happened to cause that sort of disconnect of I hate her, I don't want to be around her anymore, what had happened? And again, a lot of times it goes back to the internet. School avoidance. 25% of kids are victimized online, so if kids are avoiding coming to school or avoiding certain classes or lunchtime, what is going on behind that? With the Seattle Public Schools, a lot of people forget that the Seattle Public Schools has a disruptiveness policy based on internet behavior. Your child can be held accountable at school for things that they choose to post at home, after school, on the weekend. Cyberbullying is against the law. The RCW is actually cyber stalking. And the definition of that is with the intent to intimidate, torment, harass, or embarrass any other person. And I think what parents and kids are forgetting is that the word embarrass is written into the RCW so that your child can be held accountable for posting things with the intent to embarrass another student. So again, it is against the law. Seattle PD is the lead agency for the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force for Washington State. So since we have statewide jurisdiction, you guys are obviously in the city of Seattle. You should be getting the type of response that you want from not only the police department, but from our task force. We do take reports from schools. We do take reports from parents. We do cover the whole state, and there are only eight of us, so obviously that takes some patience, but um, we should be responding, and you should be getting the type of response that you want. If you are not getting the type of response that you want, one of two things. You can file a complaint with the website. A lot of parents and adults forget that Facebook does take complaints, and you'd be surprised how responsive they are. Two, you need to keep the school involved. Since Seattle Public Schools has a disruptiveness policy, you need to be keeping them informed of what's going on so that they can take appropriate action at school. Third thing is you can contact ICAC to file a report or make a complaint, and we will go from there. At the end, there is a site where you guys can report Internet crime, because just because your child's here doesn't mean that necessarily the offender is here. So we need to know where to report it for general abuse, not just the cyberbullying and cyber stalking um, kind of stuff. I'm kind of going to speed through a lot of this because I'm trying to be respectful of the time frame, but if you guys have questions, you can always come up and ask me at the end. I want to move on to social networking. Statistically, about 600 million people are on Facebook. It's an increase from 500 million last year. Americans account for 20.7 million of those users. And Americans spend 700 billion minutes a month on Facebook alone. So we have this unhealthy addiction and obsession to this, these sorts of websites. Hey, Sarah.
something on the internet sees it really the internet needs to be looked at as a public space so what's on it is public information not just these young attractive people that I want to see stuff or I go to school with see it complete strangers creepy people see that kind of stuff too and so let's talk about Facebook this is actually my little sister's Facebook page I stole it because she's the perfect example of what not to do <laughs> which is embarrassing because her mother is the principal of a very large high school but um, so, she tells you, this is a screenshot of her information page. Thomas is her last name, you're really not going to get much from that, but combined with her first name, now you've got her name. She tells you what school she goes to. She gives you her date of birth, month, day, and year. She tells you what town she lives in, gives you her personal email address, and her school email address. Okay, white collar crime, okay, identity theft, she hands it to you. Kids tend to think that their identity can't be stolen because they don't have a credit card or they're not getting that credit report, but that's why they're the perfect people to steal an identity from. They're not paying attention. Okay, so she gives this all to you. She's one of these people that if there's a spot and they ask for it, she'll fill it in. She doesn't think far enough ahead to think, why would I put that? So it's not a requirement to list any of this. The birthday is a big deal because... When kids are little, they're asking, they're saying happy 13th birthday or happy 12th birthday, okay? If they're not putting the year, everybody knows how to do the math. Adults, you get to an age and people stop saying happy, you know, 42nd birthday. They just kind of say happy birthday. But it needs to be looked at through a lens of common sense because what is the goal of putting your birthday online for thousands and hundreds of thousands of people to see? To make you feel better when you get 200 wall posts from people you don't know or don't talk to on your birthday, okay? Common sense wise, you don't walk up to a group of 200 people and say, it's my birthday, you know, they kind of write it down and then they have access to that information. Have to look at it from a different perspective. The other thing about her page is she has 925 pictures posted of herself. Okay, that is ridiculous. Um, the thing to know about pictures in Facebook is the minute you choose to post an image on Facebook, Facebook legally owns the rights to that photo. If they legally own the rights to that photo, that means they can do whatever they want with it and you or your kids have no legal recourse because you're giving up legal ownership. So let's talk about what you're signing up for when you sign up for these pages, you or your kids, because most kids are not reading the fine print. Okay, this is the fine print. By posting user content to any part of the site, you automatically grant and you represent and warrant that you have the right to grant to the company an irrevocable, perpetual, non-exclusive, transferable, fully paid, worldwide license with the right to sublicense, to use, copy, publicly perform, publicly display, reformat, <coughs> translate, excerpt, in whole or in part, and distribute such user content for any purpose honor and connection with the site or the promotion thereof, to prepare derivative works of or incorporate into other works such user content and to grant an authorized sublicense of, of the foregoing. <laughs> you may remove your user content from the site at any time. If you choose to remove your user content, the license granted above will automatically expire. However, you acknowledge that the company may retain archived copies. Okay. Nobody realizes what kind of ridiculous contract this is because nobody reads it. And the idea of actually thinking that they own every single thing that you put on your page and have the right to do with whatever they want to, again, she has her page set to private, which obviously is going to be the preferred setting, friends only, but then we need to talk about the definition of the word friend. She's got about 500 of them, okay? She's not that cool, 
but the idea of every child, every teenager knowing the definition of the word friend in real life and then going to Facebook.com and thinking it miraculously changes, okay? We have to really start hitting kids with common sense and the idea of if you do not know them in real life, they are not your friend in real life, they're not your Xbox friend, they're not your Facebook friend. And then you're going to share all of this personal information with people that you really don't know. So it's not about getting your kids off Facebook or getting your kids off the internet. It's really about creating responsible users and making them understand exactly where their information is going and what, they're, what really is happening with it. Which leads me to this. When you put your information on Facebook, you're not just putting it on Facebook. Facebook utilizes a public server. If you go to the website youareopenbook.org, they have tapped into that server. If I type in the words, I hate my boss, on open book search engine, everybody who's ever said that on Facebook, their profile will come up. Okay? That was 28,000 people an hour that had said that. I hate my boss. Okay. If you want to get more specific, you could type in the phrase, Seattle Police Department. Then anybody who's ever said anything about SPD, their page would come up. Followed by more specific, Denny Middle School. Anybody who's ever said anything about this school, your page will come up in the context of which you said that phrase comes up. Okay? It's the idea of people not realizing where their information goes. This website is not even a year old. It was started by three guys whose sole intent was to demonstrate how Facebook exploits your personal information, so to show you that they exploit you. It's a roundabout concept. But they're out there, you're posting to more than just Facebook's website. And it's really important to understand that you're searchable on Bing, you're searchable on Google. The website PIPL.com, you type in your name, up comes every single social networking site you or your children are on, and images of you. Okay? So you have to be aware of what you're really putting out there. Your online reputation is obviously ten times harder to repair than your physical reputation because stuff on the internet is always going to be out there. So, which leads me to other forms of social networking that kids are extremely into. Chat roulette is a big problem and the reason it is is because it, first of all you have to have a webcam to go to this website so if you don't have a webcam you're one up from everybody else but the max it's automatically built in. You go to this website, you're randomly connected with somebody anywhere in the world. You can do whatever you want on that website. There is no age limit, there is no filter, and there is nobody monitoring this. Okay, now use your worst imagination. The appropriate images I could scan are actually up at the top, the guy in the full body suit and then the guy clipping clothespins everywhere. The problem with this site, it is known predators on this site, it is known kind of sex offender trolling site. The problem is, is that you get kids who will go on the site because they think it's pretty funny, engage in a behavior or an action, 10 minutes later they're off the website not realizing that the person on the other side has the ability to record them. Then 10 minutes later it's going to be rebroadcasted on another known website that your child or you are not going to want them on. So again, it's the idea that behaving through a screen is very different than behaving in front of a live audience. Kids, again, it's the disconnect. People act differently in front of a monitor than they do a live crowd. Okay. The problem with this website is, is that it's international. It's almost impossible to police. Just to give you an idea, in Washington State there are 40,000 different IP addresses actively trading and exchanging child pornography and there's eight of us, okay? So then you're gonna put this on an international level and it's gonna be impossible, okay? Okay, let's talk about formspring.me. A lot of the schools are having a major issue with this website right now. And the problem with this website is essentially you form an account and you get to ask other users anonymous questions. And it's anonymous as to who's asked you that question. The website has it promoted as what's your favorite color or your favorite vacation spot. Okay, middle school and high school kids are not asking each other those G-rated questions, to be very blunt with you. Then you can link it to your Facebook page and it becomes a sort of honesty box where kids are telling each other what they really think about them. 
but not knowing who's posting it. Okay, so you can't track, the users can't track who's saying what. So they're anonymous to each other. Are they really anonymous? No. Do the kids think that or even go there? Absolutely not either. But again, it's this idea of really putting insults on a bathroom wall, this new age, now you're going to put them on Facebook where everybody's going to see them. And you're, not, you're going to say some really horrendous, terrible things. So as parents and adults, you need to know that these websites are out there so that you can effectively educate your children and effectively monitor what they're going to. Okay, this is huge in middle school and high school right now, this website. Facebook page and he had gotten her email address off Facebook okay for this situation he's dumb enough to email her so that we can track it and we already got that one solved and figured out but the idea is if he had not thought about emailing her that video he was still exploiting her and she would have no idea back to the definition of who you're really choosing to share pictures with who your friends are and what images you're choosing to post if you're using Facebook to share pictures with friends and family out of the area, I don't recommend it. I really recommend using a more secure site like Flickr or Shutterfly where you're pa they're password protected so that you're really minimizing even more who's looking at those images. I hate to say this, but we're in an age where little kids and pictures of little small children are not what they used to be, and people can swipe and steal those images of small kids and the picture doesn't have to be inappropriate to be used in an inappropriate way. Okay. All right, let's talk about sexting very quickly. Here are the statistics for the 12 to 17 year old age range in terms of sexting. It's going to be any image un depicting a child under the age of 18, depicting partial nudity or full nudity, and then you're going to send it from one uh, phone to the other. All right, here's the latest issue with, that we're seeing with sexting. It's this idea, again, I don't know where the media comes up with this stuff, but sextortion is now what they're calling it. And essentially, it's kids blackmailing each other for these images. Okay? Here is the law in Washington State. If a child under the age of 18 willingly sends an image of themselves depicting partial nudity or full nudity to another person, that is called distribution of child pornography. That is a felony that leads to registering as a sex offender. It doesn't matter if the image is of you. It doesn't matter if you did it because you wanted to. It doesn't matter if you shared it with a boyfriend, a girlfriend. It still is distribution of child pornography. If your child or you, because a lot of adults in the mix of sending these images out to entire contacts lists find themselves in possession of these images, which puts you as an adult in a really precarious situation because now you're in possession of child pornography and might not even know it okay if you or your child gets an image of 
partial nudity or full nudity of another child. If you do not let the police department know or your child doesn't tell somebody in a position of authority, that is considered possession of child pornography and that is a felony and that leads to registering as a sex offender. Okay. King County Prosecutor's Office gets to decide how they charge all these cases. It's discretionary. It's not up to you, it's not up to your child, it's not up to the police department. Until the laws in the state change, these images are considered child pornography and they have to be looked at as such. All right, here are the offender highlight, highlights for internet crime against children cases. Is this 100% of the time? No. I will tell you when I get bought and sold online in undercover operations, statistically this is who is responding to the ads, okay? Unlike the Dateline to Catch a Predator series, at the end of that, you see kind of the updates where they say this person got a slap on the wrist or this person got a misdemeanor. What happens when we do these undercover operations is that the person gets arrested for attempted rape of a minor. Okay? It's automatically a five to ten year prison sentence. So it's not anything that our department in this task force takes lightly. But statistically, internet crime is not something you can walk down the street and pick out who is in possession of these images or who is trolling the internet for these particular images or doing these sorts of behaviors. We keep data, but again, it usually falls within this area of Caucasian, having a higher education or formal degree, being a professional in terms of being able to maintain that outside employment and then having a higher rate of mental health issues as well as beginning to use the internet at an older age. <coughs> Meeting a teen girl online is easy. They're so desperate for attention. Attention from older guys is flattering. They get me more than guys my age. Age lets me play the supportive older guy and act interested. It isn't the same things. You get to know someone when you're Chatting talking. seems unthreatening to them. Once I talk about how perfect we are for each other. Other people don't understand. If you trust someone, what's wrong with you? Meeting them is the goal. That's when things get really interesting. Online predators know what they're doing. Do you? This is probably going to be too small for you guys to see, but the highlights of this are that we know that girls are more likely to instant message and boys are more likely to do online gaming. A lot of people are under the, interpret the misconception that since the Dateline to Catch a Predator series aired that kids are no longer meeting people that they first met on the internet, but from a 2010 survey we know that one third of all high school students have met somebody in real life that they first met online. Okay? One third is huge. Okay. Out of that one third, about 23% of the boys and 13% of the girls reported some sort of sexual encounter afterwards. So people are still choosing to meet people that they do not know. Is that a, are these questions? Repeat it. Oh, one third of all high school students have met somebody in real life that they first met online. Out of that one third, 23% of boys and 13% of girls reported a sexual encounter. These are self-reporting statistics. Are they most likely higher than this? Absolutely, but again, kind of take what you can get. All right, so why are teens more likely to be victimized? They have a lower expectation of privacy. A lot of teenagers have grown up with the internet on the cell phone. A lot of kids grow up with this sort of, well, why do you need the iPhone? Well, I just want it, I need it, everybody has it. Okay, the iPods, iPads, laptops, I mean, you name it, they know it, and they probably know how to use it better than you. Okay? You have to keep yourself aware of the technology. You don't have to be on Facebook, but do you need to understand Facebook? Absolutely. Do you need to have their password? Absolutely. Do you need to be able to effectively monitor it? Absolutely. Okay? Kids are more likely to engage in overly sexual behavior online because to them it's different than doing it in real life. Have to communicate that really doing something behind a screen is no different than doing it in front of a live audience. And that if you don't take a photo and put it on the internet, if you're not comfortable standing in front of a crowd in that same outfit, then you don't do it. Okay? Because again, Statistically, more people see something, obviously, when you put it on the internet than when you do it in front of a live audience anyways. 
And then the ability to, mis to conceal misconduct is huge. Since most kids know how to navigate the technology better than their parents, it's easier to manipulate. Okay? As an adult, again, you have to be aware of the technology and what's going on. All right, so parents and kids, about 75% of parents have no clue where their children go on the Internet. Absolutely no clue. No clue where to even report Internet crime. Okay? And then the other problem is, is that adolescents, since kids don't anticipate risk or consequence, it's not about laying down these boundaries of no, 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 no. It's about explaining, keeping the lines of communication open. When I'm going around and talking to kids at schools, a lot of kids will disclose certain things to me, and I find that very odd because I don't know them. But I look like one of them, unfortunately. <laughs> and a lot of kids think that as long as they can talk to somebody that's not their parent, that's, they're not going to get in trouble or lose a bunch of privileges, they'll feel comfortable disclosing. So it's really about keeping those lines of communication open because if they're not telling you and they don't have that outside person, what happens is they're not telling anybody. And then they're not telling anybody until it's too late. So what rules? Again, every household is different. These are very generic rules. You can choose to implement your own. I will tell you that a lot of times there's a misconception with a group of parents thinking that they have internet rules, and then you ask those parents, their, their ch kids, do you have rules at home, and it's a different answer. Okay? If your kid doesn't know about the rules or can't regurgitate them to you or the consequences, then they don't really exist. This one is, I think, been around for a long time, but people are still not following it. But statistically, it's really important because 70% of online predators met the child in the privacy of their own bedroom. It might be nice to have a laptop, a TV, and a cell phone in your child's room for them, and maybe it's nice for you too, but you can't effectively monitor what they're doing. You don't have eyes in the back of your head. You cannot walk by and see them minimizing screens. You do not know what chat rooms they're in or if they're choosing to chat. You don't even know if they're the bully of school, what they're choosing to put on Facebook or if they're choosing to torment another child because you can't see it. Um, back to the issue of talking to you if they come across something that makes them feel uncomfortable. It's always great to give kids a second out. It's an awkward conversation to have the sexting discussion or these inappropriate posts and images with your kids, but if you can give them somebody else that you feel comfortable with them going to, you know, a sister, a brother, a family friend, a coach, something like that that they feel like, well, it's uncomfortable to talk to mom about, but, you know, I could talk to this person about, and you let them know that you're okay with that, that's really a great thing to do. Communication. Again, you cannot turn a blind eye to the computer. You cannot be home all the time. Every cell phone has the internet on it now. You have to have these conversations. Kids are more likely, obviously, to be victimized by each other than this unknown predator boogeyman. But they're more likely to be victimized by each other because of what they choose to do on the internet. Okay, My sister is more likely to be victimized because she chooses to put her entire identity on Facebook. She's going to list her wall and tell you where she is every day at every minute. Okay? You don't walk up to a group of strangers outside you know, Quest or Safeco with a piece of paper and give them a detailed outline of your day and where you're going to be and what you look like and what you're going to be wearing. That would be creepy. But it's no different than putting that on a Facebook wall, like, I'm out of town, can't wait to go on family vacation, and then that's like, please rob me on your forehead because I'm not home. Okay. There are websites dedicated to trolling Facebook for people who are on vacation and out of town. I think it's actually called pleaserobme.com. Okay, so be informed. Knowing what access your child has is huge. As a parent, if you pay the cell phone bill, you have a right to see the text messages. Okay. As a parent, you pay for the internet, you have a right to know what sites your child's going to. The um, technology news is a great way to keep up with what's going on. Mashable.com is a social networking news site, so all they put on that website is the social networking and technology news. You can go to that. You can read that. I read that every day. What was that one again? Mashable. Mashable.com. Mashable mm -hmm. 
if your children are spending a lot of times at friends' houses, which if they're teenagers, I'm assuming they are, make sure you have these conversations with those children's parents or guardians because you might have one set of rules, but other parents are going to have other rules. Okay, the public library, you can access all of these sorts of things at the public library. So being aware of that. Don't unsubscribe to unwanted emails again. What that really does is put, bounces back a message to whatever spam company has sent it, really, and then you just keep getting them. Okay, that's why unsubscribing doesn't work. If you label it as spam and then have it be designated to that folder, then you don't even have to see it. Legitimate companies like Costco or REI or something like that, unsubscribing will work, but most of the junk mail you're getting that you're trying to unsubscribe to, the unsubscribing will not be effective. Okay. This is where you want to report internet crime to. The cyber tip line is run through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. You make a complaint. You can choose to do it anonymously. I use that word loosely because nothing is really anonymous. But you cannot give your name if you want. And you give a description about what's going on. Let's say your child's on Xbox and being harassed or being sent uncomfortable material. You can make a report. The National Center will open a case and they'll start digging into whatever the report is. They'll find out where the person is because just because you're in Seattle does not mean the offender is. Then they'll send a report to the local ICAC task force of wherever that person is. We're in all 50 states. So every morning, Seattle PD gets a stack of cyber tips with offenders in this area so that you have the right people responding to the right crimes. So on my victims list, I have victims that are all over the country and the world. Okay. We also work with the vice unit. We're also very big into doing the commercially sexually exploited youth stuff in terms of the juvenile prostitution and the Craigslist ads and all of that sort of stuff. If you come across things of that nature, I encourage you to report that as well. That was very quick, but I was trying to get through as much information as possible. This is my information. Feel free to email me if you have a question, if something comes up. The bottom is netsmarts.org is the internet safety website run through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It has resources for law enforcement, parents, kids, age-appropriate activities, all of that sort of stuff.